Hello and welcome to the podcast. We have a very special guest with us today. Uh, he came over from South Africa, started off as a sports coach at a local school, went on to head the sports department in a short space of time, where his main focus was cricket alongside other sports. He then went on to coach at a couple of local clubs, Spencer being the first one, where he then became the director of cricket. He's now the director of cricket at Wimbledon Cricket Club. And hopefully you guys find some really valuable insights and some golden nuggets from his experiences and his journey. So yeah, hope you enjoy the podcast. So we have Jonathan Speller with us today. Jonathan, how are you? Very good, mate. Thank you very much for having me on. Of course, no problem. It's a real pleasure to have you and discuss your life experiences as a coach <laughs> and now a director of cricket. So how did it all begin? Yeah, it's um, it's been a whirlwind of a journey, one filled with a lot of triumph, a lot of hard work, but then also, you know, being able to look at the bigger picture, you know, trying to work out exactly what I wanted out of cricket and coaching, which... I guess all started back when I was 13 in South Africa, made my uh, first 11 debut for um, the Old Parks Cricket Club. And it was sort of at that point where there were those dreams of, well, actually, you know, could I become a cricketer? Should I become a cricketer? Am I good enough to become uh, a professional cricketer? And, uh, you know, started to put in the, the graft as a player. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that a lot of professionals, you know, they are good players, but it comes... A point where they 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 need to learn the actual game and learn how their game fits within that, and then specialize from from that point. And that does happen later in life than a lot of people think. You know, eight year olds who who tell me they are leg spinners and will only be leg spinners, so they don't need to practice how to bat. That's a thing of the past, I think. And so uh, I took it upon myself to throw myself into any form of cricket, be that playing. Uh, I started doing my cricket coaching levels. Uh, I started volunteering at the club just threw myself in it at what age did you start doing that uh from 14 okay so yeah made made that uh, that debut at 13 which which was you know exciting but i was very much a, a small fish in a big pond and it was a way of by by giving back to the club it was a way of sort of making myself a little bit bigger a, li a little bit more noticeable to people and you know that could be anything from making Boravos rolls on a on a Saturday after after games or uh, or giving some some coaching tips to, to the very youngest members that we had at the time and uh, yeah as I said I did my 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 coaching courses my coaching levels and started to use that at the club and as I sort of progressed through the equivalent here of county age group training into sort of more the EPP things within uh, the Gauteng Cricket Board it got to a point where at 18 I really had to make a decision as to whether I thought I could make it and become a, a professional cricket player I had a lot of pressure from my parents to make sure that I still went to university and that I did get a degree and so I, I weighed everything up and, and, and thought to myself you know am I gonna am I gonna be able to achieve this or do I pivot a little bit how do I stay within cricket for the longest period of time because I just love it and how so, much how much just on that hmm. how much influence did the coaches have on you to make that decision um, a huge amount. I, so I had I had a uh, uh, more than a handful of of coaches that I had either had one to one sessions with. They did club coaching with me. Old school heads of cricket who I stayed in contact with. They all helped me sort of see the bigger picture when it came to uh, a cricket career that wasn't a guarantee. I was no, you know. Jason Roy or Morgan. I, I wasn't coming through the ranks, setting the world on fire. But there was an possibility that I could have made a decent stint career within within cricket early you know early 20s but then look to to go into uh, something else later on and that that those conversations that we had we found out whether that that was what I wanted did I did I want to give it a full go have five years in the game and then feel like that was it close the chapter and move on and I think I was more excited at that point having coached a few others having been a part of a cricket club that you know there was a legacy that you could build and a, you know a legacy and your involvement can last until you're 60 70 years old some of the guys that I'm talking about at the time were 65 you know now they're now they're late 80s yeah. uh, and, and we still have those conversations just on that what do you think then going through that sort of phase of your life where you possibly could have made it 
there's always a coach who believes that you can make it that really pushes you to keep going keep going and then obviously like you're saying on the other side it was the thinking of okay education university all that sort of stuff how did you make that final decision that final step okay maybe I can't so I you know whereas you had the talent clearly to potentially make it (laughs) it's very kind of you well at 13 if you're playing first team cricket then you know there's there's something there right so what made you make that decision okay maybe a cricket career is maybe not what I I can do or want to do maybe I think the conversations I, I was fortunate that the conversations I always had with coaches I had quite forward-thinking coaches sort of who who follow the philosophies we now teach which is it should always be player-led so I was I don't think I was ever told what to do it was always here are your options so they would they would go in in in-depth as to what a route through coaching might look like um, what mentoring might look like what working within a system might look like working privately might look like in cricket ultimately just guiding me on the the positives and negatives of each and then it was up to up to me to decide in terms of what tipped me over uh to deciding to 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 be a coach i think having looked at the the pros and cons the pros of staying within the game longer than just a short period that 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 tipped it for me i think i could see myself being just as proud to bring up the next South African, now maybe English player, as I would if I had taken the field myself. You know, I'd have more of a crack at it. Yeah. Um, that way I'd, I'd be able to, to experience cricket in different countries, different players, different backgrounds. That was really important to me, still is to this day. You know, equality and opportunity within cricket is something that I think we really need to address. And I felt, well, I had a real chance at doing that whereas as a player I could easily have fallen into uh, self-love my small little niche um, and then and then sort of disappeared after four or five years yeah so this all all of this uh, thinking that you did was in your early 20s that's correct yeah yeah okay so quite a young age to be thinking so far long term and then what made you think that the UK is the place to be then yeah so uh, on the point of, of of sort of the age when I was mm. when I was thinking that you know I was obviously I'm South African and I was in South Africa at the time and and we were going through some political transformation and so uh, these more adult maybe conversations were being had at a at a at a much younger age we were we were very aware of it it was something that if you loved cricket and you loved the game of cricket you understood that these transformations needed to happen they needed to happen quickly and so that's probably why more South Africans can look ahead in terms of legacy and and, and in terms of the, the the seeds we sow now you know what that could look like in the future and we sort of we all follow for the most part we follow the uh, Mandela Ubuntu philosophy you know it's not Which about is- not about me i am i am who i am because of who we are yeah um, collective. absolutely yeah absolutely and you know we had these these conversations it became very apparent to me that if i became a very good coach i could so like i said the seeds of the future trees or future generations you know get to enjoy the shade and uh, and that really inspired me uh probably more than playing cricket or taking polls myself yeah and so the UK was an option to me because my father's British okay he's a British passport it was he married my mom at a time where uh, she instantly got a British passport and his children got British passports as well so since birth I've had the option of easily and readily being able to come to the UK half my family's over here as well and so you know it never felt like it was a big move it was just a move to the other side of my family my other home I met my girlfriend uh, at the time now wife uh, at university and she was looking to come over and spend a year or two gaining some work experience in some of the biggest corporations she could and London being the centre of the world, really, um, that was a good place to go. So we sort of took the plunge together. Yeah, what's it, 13 years later, mortgage and two kids. Um, (laughs) And she's now my wife. (laughs) It seemed to have been a a good gamble. But um, in terms of cricket, obviously, we're as fanatical in the UK about cricket as we are in, in South Africa. So when I first came over, I found any job I could. 
this was in 2008, pre the uh, the recession. Yeah. I landed, I don't know how, but um, a dream first job where I worked with a company that had the other set of rights to the European tour from the RNA. And what we did was, this is sort of pre-YouTube, we did behind the scenes uh, content of the European tour. Nice. And so I got yeah. to travel out with uh, a team of producers and cameramen, and we would interview the likes of Ernie Els, Tiger Woods, um, Sergio Garcia on uh, practice days, you know, on, on the range before events, go and see uh, what they did in the evenings between, you know, days one and four. And it was, uh, it was really eye opening to me, you know, to, to see these professionals on a more human side. And, uh, and also to see, because we were with them all the time, week on week, to see the, the ups and downs yeah. that they went through as well, even at the, you know, very top of their game. And so I guess, in the back of my mind, there was always this, uh, this sort of this coaching uh, voice that was looking at it from that point of view to say, you know, uh, coaching never stops. And during that time, I would volunteer to go in at uh, Belleville School in Clapham and run some morning clubs for them. And uh, anyway, it all was fine, all was great. And then the recession happened and a, a business plan that was built largely on uh, online advertising spend uh, during a, a recession isn't a good place to be. Yeah. And uh, and so we, we called it quits with uh, golf bug. And at the same within the same week, I was very lucky that the school, uh, Belleville, that I had been working at in the mornings, asked if I could give some more time. And it was, uh, I guess it was a, a, you know, a fork in the road, a tipping point. It was a, a, a moment where I was brave enough to say, well, if we're going to do more, why don't we do full time? Um, and I think in the first year, they arranged for the PTA to pay my salary. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, um, the head teacher, this guy called uh, John grove he's uh his background was as a as, as a cricket coach he uh first taught alex tudor oh nice yeah down in ellsfield where where they where they used to live on on the estate there um cricket for the first time he 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 knew what sport could do for a lot of children who struggle with academics or or, or children who you know within a p lesson shone but but struggled in all other forms of um, school life, and he knew how important sport could be um, in closing any sort of attainment gaps and social gaps mm. between children. So he taught me a lot of that in this first year. But the the point being, he was willing to um, sit down, make a plan with me, uh, a radical plan, because we only taught cricket as part of a PE curriculum for the whole year. That yeah. we we dropped football, we dropped gymnastics, we dropped every other sport wow. for cricket to try and entrench the values of cricket and, yeah. and really give it a go. And uh, and thankfully, you know, that really worked. There's some great photos of us playing cricket in the playground with snow around us, yeah. you know, bright orange ball floating <laughs> around. And all the children took to it and they, they really enjoyed it because I think cricket can be accessed from uh, all, all different aspects. You don't just have to be, you know, a bowler or a batsman or a fielder. There were, there were children who loved the statistics behind it. And I know a lot of adult cricketers love to throw themselves into the statistics of the game. There were, were those that enjoyed the umpiring aspects. There were those, even at the age of, of uh, seven or eight, who liked the idea of coaching, yeah. teaching others. Mm. Not necessarily because they were very good themselves, but they understood theoretically the basics of what made a good cricketer. So I guess those first 12 months, we almost in a state school, had a cricket academy running. And that's how I was very fortunate to be able to, to, to run with that. So when you looked at Belleville School, did you know the background of the head? Or how did you come about that? Because it will be interesting to know that for a young coach who is potentially looking to get into coaching, does a bit of coaching on the side at clubs and stuff, but needs something maybe a bit more full time. Mm. And schools tend to offer that option did you seek that out did you know that already were you quite proactive with that I didn't I didn't know that he was a cricket coach prior uh, what I what I did know is that the school looked at pupils holistically okay they they put an emphasis on physical education they see they had a um, head of P at the time they looked at any sort of TAs and support staff who wanted to specialize within sport or within PE at the school. They they were open to that. So I could see that there was potential that this sort of 
sports department might grow. They were an outstanding school, so you know they were striving for betterment rather than to try and bring up standards. So that's that's obviously a good starting place. Yeah. I guess if I had to give anyone any advice is even if a school that you're you're looking at or you have an opportunity at isn't like that, you can drive that change. There is a lot of research that's gone into how PE can help all other aspects of school, how, you know, starting with um, some form of exercise in the morning keeps the mind more alert throughout the day. So we introduced that as well, doing some 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 exercise at your at your behind your your chair at your desks. We found as well having a structured uh, sports program meant that more children were able to access sport in a way that suited them. As I mentioned, you know, you didn't necessarily have to be learning how to bowl uh, to get involved in the in our cricket program. But what we found was the more children were exposed together, the more they learned from each other as well. Once they started learning from each other, that changed behaviours at lunchtime yeah. in, in play groups and. You know, my nugget would be throw yourself in. You know, never think that uh, a PE program has to be just that singular hour. You can bring it into um, a week, sorry, singular hour a week for um, for the curriculum. Mm -hmm. You can bring it into all aspects. You know, we would bring it into, as I said, before school, lunch times, there's after school. You know, I took as much work as they were willing to give me yeah. and, and then showed them that potentially with a couple of extra hours, three extra hours of full time, what that role might look like. You know, that that led a lot of thinking and believing in PE to a government run initiative that we were heavily involved in and I tutored on where teachers who are looking to get qualified, you know, do their PGC and, you know, uh, coach to teach first, coach first, they would take a two-year degree and in that two-year degree 50 percent of the time would be spent on english maths and science mm. your core subjects and 50 percent of the time on how to deliver physical education okay so that was very interesting obviously i dealt with the physical education side it's yeah. been a while since i taught any uh, english math science and then these the idea was that these young newly qualified teachers would go out into hubs that were relatively closely geographically located and in those hubs they would be able to know each other create alliances or you know create fixtures share equipment you know have a, a central hub brains trust mm. where certain areas could then be targeted to bring up the uh, the sport profile and uh, and that seems to have worked really well and it's something that you know I would suggest that other people looking to go down the more formalized route of sporting, coaching, you know, within schools, look into. Yeah. Um, those hubs are, are really, really important. And there are many on, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, groups of all of us that work within coaching yeah. where people are very giving of their time, of their knowledge. So seek it out, ask. There's no stupid question when it comes to, to coaching. And, and also remember that there are no unique ideas. Um, we magpie that's that's what we want to do because the common goal is that we see all the children that we that we coach or part of our programs you know develop to the very best of their ability and so you know any little tweaks or changes that we do in our environment might not be suited to yours but that doesn't mean that that drill becomes ours you know yeah. um, and in my experience all you have to do is ask yeah uh, and yeah. you'll and you'll you'll get help so yeah, it's it's been, as you can hear, a bit of a, a mix match. I think the underlying theme, though, has been I had made my mind up early on that I wasn't going to be a professional cricketer, but I wanted to be the best possible coach. Yeah. And that meant I was going to have to work really hard, dive at any opportunity um, to show people who I was and, and my coaching style and uh, put the hard yards in as a coach early so that hopefully I could climb lank radar as say at a school or mm. within a club where then I could help shape programs um, and from shaping programs you sort of open up opportunities um, not only on a local scale but possibly on a, a regional or a national scale and so you know that's where I find myself now. What do you think makes a successful coach in terms of is it the focus of climbing the ladder or is it the focus on delivering the best quality coaching you can? Putting putting children first. 
yeah. absolutely putting children first. I think I think you know that climbing the ladder, that um, personal coach growth comes from putting the hard yards in and never wavering from the fact that you're there for the children uh, and for development. Um, so the more you give to you know little. Sandra or little Johnny or you know whomever at uh, the most grassroots level from there uh, a reputation as a coach builds you'll get referrals friends will want to to get involved you know I used to even do birthday parties for kids you know who would have thought they wanted their PE teacher at their birthday <laughs> party but um, I think I think there's there, there becomes like a camaraderie uh, when children and they're very good judges of character they, they judge very quickly and are usually brutally honest uh, if they can, if they feel safe and that you have the best intentions for them, they'll back you. They'll go on that journey with you. And uh, the more you build that up at a grassroots level, the easier it then becomes to suggest, you know, maybe a winter course or a program to be able to document that is really important. You know, I think all coaches have lots of great ideas very few of us actually sit down and write them down. Yeah. And I think you'll find once you write them down, you actually document it. And I'm not meaning you own that. Mm. Uh, as I said, we magpie everything. But, you know, your approach, once it's documented, that allows you to align your thoughts and to know where in the coaching sort of stage you're at. You know, we're currently doing it at the Wimbledon Club now with our two new heads of uh, junior boy and junior girl coaches. They, they'd never, they've never experienced being sort of a teacher they've always been coaches and it's something that I'm trying to impart on them was the learning curve I had entering into a teaching environment as a coach there is a big difference yeah. and I think the best coaches merge those two understanding that you know children aren't not doing something because they don't want to or they're choosing to be difficult it's because they've reached a point where some teaching needs to happen you need to help them understand why and how to do something not just say put your arm higher up at release or you know yeah. get on the front foot to play it there's there's a degree of taking your coaching hat off and 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 looking more from a teacher's point of view yeah. from a more human personal point of view absolutely yeah Absolutely. You know, not, not, not forgetting that not everyone starts with the same amount of knowledge. Not yeah. everyone's had the same experiences or uh, exposure to, to the game uh, in the same way as everyone else. So, you know, it's one of the, the fun drills we do as coaches CPD is to say to the coaches, I want you to teach yourself and write down how you would coach yourself to, if you're right-handed, bowl with your left hand um, that gives you a, a very slight or small insight into what it must be like to learn something again for the very first time yeah um, but don't forget when you do that you still have all of that background knowledge uh, in terms of how you should move how your body moves the fact that you know how your body moves you know this is left this is right this is how I jump this is how I skip don't I think don't as a coach ever assume anything you know look to run some form of ongoing assessment in your head as to where the, where where this child is at what is the next step what's the next achievable step that you can unlock for them and then tell them and if just in in explaining the next step they can get it great if they if they struggle with that as a, as a good coach, you should be able to break down what those next steps are yeah. uh, or that next goal is into some success criteria, things that are easily achievable, yeah. you know, statements that are answerable with a, a yes, no. Can you do this? Yes. Can you do this? No. Well, in order to achieve that no into a yes, these are the things that you need to be able to do. So it's looking at, um, as I said, coaching holistically. It's really important. And obviously, as a coach, it's all about you, you learn as you go. And naturally, you have setbacks, you make mistakes, there will be days which just don't go to plan. How do you cope with that? How do you learn from that move forward? What would you suggest that a young coach does in that situation? Back to documenting everything, making sure you've got plans and, and not just plans that say, we're going to do the front foot drive today. 
as I, you know, I've spoken, you need to be able to break down those milestones. You need to break down success criteria in such a way that it's accessible for all children at a variety of uh, attainment levels. So making sure that you you have a plan, that you've spent some time thinking about who the audience is, who the coaching group is or the individual is, uh, tailoring it beforehand, not just using you know 2017's plan because they're under 11s and this is the second week, really thinking about the, the group that you've, you've got in front of you uh, before they're in front of you, making sure that you're honest during the session because you're right, some sessions don't go according to plan and that's fine having a backup so that it isn't uh, a complete waste of time is quite important so not assuming that everything and plowing through a i call it a lesson right but plowing through a, a poor session and then post that session being really honest with yourself and actually taking pen to paper i think is important and annotating that plan marking out where it may have gone wrong writing why you thought it may have gone wrong spending the time to 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 also congratulate yourself on things that went really well yeah. uh, and sort of maybe there were things that you expanded on that you hadn't thought you would but you know this group was able to to achieve quicker than you thought they would by documenting all of this down one it'll make it easier for you to do those those continual assessments in your mind as to where and how quickly they've progressed through program that you've set but also it, it'll help you not forget things week to week session to session that you may have thought you had covered off but never quite got round to. Mm. And you don't want to leave any any gaps or make a gap between their attainment too wide, you know, unachievable. You know, you don't go from bowling a decent line and length at uh, 50 miles an hour to, you know, the next I session. Know, know. <laughs> <laughs> to the next session being being asked, you know, can you swing the ball round this target and land it on, you know, the batsman's toes at 70 miles an hour. That's, that's unattainable. That's yeah. unachievable. And as a result would be incredibly demotivated motivating not just for that player but for you as a coach and it would render your plan quite useless at the end of a a whole season you could then look back at your plans and I think it's important then to at that point look at rewriting those annotations into your plan so it's it's a continual and a continuous assessment process not just for yourself as a coach, but for those groups of individuals. And, you know, to, if you're not going to take that group the following year, to have a proper handover period to the person who is going to look after them, that's just going to help keep that progression of the children merrily going along, you know. I think some of the biggest complaints you'll hear as a coach from parents or from children themselves is they feel that they keep going over the same things. You know, we've done this before. We did this two years ago. And while there are subtle differences between, again, facing something at 50 miles an hour that you have to block out or something now because you're two, three years older at 70 miles an hour. There's subtle differences, but then play up that subtle difference. There's 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 learning to be had there. Explain why 70 miles an hour is so different to 50 and why it might be happening now as children have grown, uh, as uh, kids start getting into the gym from 17 onwards, 16 onwards. Keeping them in tune with where they are on their learning journey will really help with that. But what, what we don't want is kids feeling like week one is about the block, week two is about the drive, then we do a little bit of cutting, then we do some game scenarios. Yeah. We've got to start, I think, as, as, as coaches, uh, and we are open and honest about our own personal growth to, to look at children holistically, and it doesn't matter whether it's you know a Spencer child or a, or a Wimbledon child. When you get in front of them, they are just a child who is at this particular attainment level and hopefully you've been told that and then you're going to progress them on from there yeah so essentially self-critiquing self-assessment is absolutely crucial if you want to grow yeah so just the willingness to learn and accepting there will be mistakes being brutally honest yeah absolutely if you, you see your coaching journey as a learning journey much like the children you're, you're teaching, uh, it isn't going to be plain sailing. There's no, there's no amount of hours and planning that will ensure that everything runs smoothly. Anything could have an effect on that. You know, one or two individuals in a group who've had a bad day or had a really good day yeah. can change. You know how that session is approached. The weather. Yeah. can change how that session is approached, how you're feeling that day, you know, how your week's been, you know, what's on your mind. It's, I think it's very important just to be brutally honest about it and make the best possible choices and decisions with what's in front of you and never underestimating the power 
of being prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Having thought more than just the logistics of I need X number of bats, balls, cones, and I will do the session. It's 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 thinking uh, a little bit deeper about the individuals who are humans and who are you yeah. know are trying their best most of the time and want to be there, who want to learn uh, how to get the best out of them. So that segues quite nicely into what I was going to ask is how do you give constructive criticism as a coach to a child who maybe is having a bad day or maybe is having a really good day? How do you keep them level headed? You know, either way, how would you do that? Being honest. I think as children are great characters uh, or judges of characters, you know, readers of room temperature, if you step out of your honest comfort zone and you give empty or, or slightly hollow feedback, I think that can have a, a really negative effect, even if that empty or slightly disingenuous feedback is to try and bolster them. I think they read through that. And I think that, that that probably hurts the coach relationship, the coaching, you know, to pupil relationship and sows slight seeds of doubt as to everything else that you're trying to, to teach them. So, you know, being honest, every child is different. Every child approaches the game for different reasons. And there are a lot of other factors, external factors, environmental, parent, teacher, coach, that apply certain pressures or expectations on the children. And I think good coaches understand all of those. You don't necessarily try and protect the children from all of those, but you can be there to encourage yeah. and cheerlead through those. So, you know, a lot of pressure is put on children. We see it at club level a lot by parents who, for all the right reasons, they want to see their children succeeding. They want to be able to share in in their successes. And even parents find it difficult when things don't go the right way because, you know, obviously this is one of the most precious commodities in their, in, their, in their lives, right? So to see that look of or that, that feel of disappointment, it can make that 20-minute car ride home after a game quite challenging. But also those time periods, that debrief after the game is so important to help reset and to go again. What we want to make sure is that children see failure as a learning point. Failing at something or not getting the outcome that you want isn't cross against your name. It's not a, a hole in your game. More, uh, oh. Should coaches mm. encourage more failure, essentially? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and failure doesn't mean losing games. Exactly. Failure, failure means pushing yourself into a position where you may feel slightly out of your comfort zone and you might you know, not do as well as you thought you were going to do so that you understand where you're at yeah. better. You know, in an ideal world, I'd like to see coaches do that within practice more than, you know, out in a match where you can't control those those external factors like teammates' opinions. They're, they're feeling like they're letting down their teammates or all the coaches, parents, umpires that are there, yeah. uh, that are there watching. But failure does allow us to know what we're going to work on next, yeah. or where we should look next. If we're constantly entering our players, our teams into leagues or into competitions where we know they're going to win everything, if we keep playing teams that are just the best in class, mm. yeah, I agree that winners have parties and losers have meetings. Yeah. But it can be scary sometimes to to hear that first time a, a team or a, a child has lost a game is at the age of under 14. Hmm. I query how much they've actually learned to that point. And can you be sure that, you know, there aren't four or five stars that are carrying a team of 11 through to that point? And while those stars might be able to access cricket at a higher level where they then fail and yeah. learn you know, at a club level, is that is that right that... We have people, yeah, part of a winning side, but we're not fully developing them. We haven't yeah. given them the opportunity to fail. You know, that's how we, we look at it at Wimbledon. We've done away with necessarily playing our very best players in the in the A team. We look holistically at all of all of our players. We do a slight stream within a training session because you do want those who are achieving above what would be expected at their age to be challenged by others yeah. who are the same. But when it comes down to selection for matches, we'd far prefer to see children 
brought into those squads, brought into those teams with specific roles, easily easily identifiable successes, yeah. uh, success criteria. So if we bring in a child to open the bowling, who would normally, quote unquote, play B's into the A's, one singular focus, we would like you to bowl with the new ball. And this is what success looks like. This is what a you know, good day looks like. And, and this is what it might not look like. Um, but is there is there a balance in that where let's say from my I can speak from my own personal experience I used to open the bat when I was under nines through to under 16s and now I open the bowling as an adult I've seen a lot of parents who who bring a 12 year old in and say oh we don't want to want to get him the best bat because he's just a bowler is it too easy to just pigeonhole players into a batsman or a bowler where they are still developing and like you're saying when they get to 16 17 onwards they they bulk up a bit go to a gym they'll they'll uh, learn new skills they'll better some old skills and then turn into a completely different player to what they were five years ago absolutely and if you're in a team that's always winning and that becomes the focus we win you know the under whatever league every year how easy is it for you to be pigeonholed into the you're an opening bowler he's an opening batsman where when we take an approach where we're we're selecting on roles that role might not be because you're most proficient at that it's because you would like to try that new yeah. role so if we play you in a side uh, and you've said well actually rather than open the batting I'd like to try some leg spin. We're we're very open to that. In yeah. fact, we encourage that. We want as many kids to try as many aspects of the game as possible. You know, much like you, I used to be a batsman before I became a bowler. Yeah. But it was a, a standard practice that, you know, especially as I'm, I was the youngest in our squad. I didn't really have a say. Yeah. I didn't get to learn as a big fish. Uh, I'd, I'd never learned at age group level how to captain. Never, never, never even close to being a captain. However, as as I grew uh, and, and sort of became the, uh, a bigger fish in a slightly smaller pond because it was the same side, I was able to have more conversations at the top of my mark, have to have more say as to how we approach certain things when I would come on and bowl. So that can be lost as well when we pigeonhole and, and think only the win. Because when we start to think like that and people want to, you know, say my child is doing really well and he plays two, three years up at school. I totally get, you know, schools approaching that that way. You know, they've got a they've sort of got a finite usage of yeah. of children because once they have done their a-levels and finished their final year that's that yeah they're gone as a club coach or as a just a coach of cricket generally someone who who wants to do it for the rest of their lives i could have the same child or the same person for 30 40 50 years as yeah. you know as they evolve and they change and they want more or less from the game so it can be a, tr- a tricky balancing out where people's expectations are because you're really good you should be playing higher and and constantly being challenged but the negative being that you're constantly being challenged in that one aspect of the game whereas we approach it that uh, at Wimbledon no players play above an age group if you're we come to a point where you you really are pushing two three years above because you must get kids who are maybe too good for an age group and they probably comes back to the point of pushing them and getting them out of their comfort zone maybe do you not feel that you know an under 12 who's too good really to really push him try under 13s under 14s a game game or two i don't at all so i don't i don't i don't buy into it in the sense that if that under 12 is so good i'm assuming that they take five six wickets every time they go out that they score 50 to 100 every time they go out and if it's not every time well possibly that's a goal just to make sure that we yeah. are able to do it the majority of the time that child might then be in a position where they could take a more leadership role you know the under 12 who's really good going up to under 15 is not going to take on any leadership role very seldom do you see anyone sending that under 12 out in front of the under 15s who then listen and uh, and follow his leadership there is an opportunity as well as we said to explore if that 12 year old is uh, taking five wickets a game well if he's taking five wickets a game up top can we Get him to do it later on with the older ball, possibly, if we're talking about a seamer. Could we get them not to ball and develop their batting? You know, not all the time. Obviously, they need to keep up their skill development, but could we do it a one-on-one off? Do it as a batsman, do it as a bowler? Could we, could we maybe stop seeing age group levels as 
the end of cricket and and the ultimate factor. Yeah. Uh, it's not. Um, what I was g- going to say earlier is, you know, if an under twelve is genuinely two or three years above, let's look to the adult game. If they if they are in that position, let's look to the adult game at twelve years old. What Sunday friendlies could we get them involved in? Because any child who's developed or any cricketer who's developed knows there's a big difference between playing age group cricket and then playing adult cricket. Yeah. And adult cricket, you're going to play for 30 years. But that ball's bowled a lot heavier. That pressure is absorbed a lot easier than, than age group stuff. So to see a 13-year-old taking the field with an adult side in, say, a fifth eleven, uh, and developing those skills, that singular skill, that opening the bowling, that, for me, is, uh, is a far better way to go. It also doesn't take away from any of the 14, 15-year-olds whose place you would be taking playing up. Of course. And that's, you know, a, quite an important point as well. Not everyone, again, approaches the game for the same reasons or is at the same attainment levels as, as everyone else. One of the, the sacred parts of age group cricket is it blocks others or should block others from taking opportunity away from you it's a lot easier to keep equal opportunity when we do have natural barriers to that but listen we can talk we can talk around this point a lot you you know talk about ice hockey drafts only being from the third month of the year because they're the oldest in the age group and you know that exposure to better coaching or to to other programs and absolutely it speeds up progress dramatically depending on what environment you're in but that might be the detriment to others and driving it right back to my philosophy you know ubuntu we we don't knowingly put ourselves ahead if it's going to be detrimental to those around us yeah um, we rather grow together and stay within the game you know it's it, interesting topic in in club level right now is if we're approaching it currently as a collective the right way why as our age groups at club level increase i think very few clubs especially after covid and people wanting to really get out uh, outdoors again and, and experience team sport why if we are seeing an increase in numbers are we not year on year going to see an increase in adult team numbers of people yeah. coming through there is a huge still a massive drop off at the under 15 16 year group and why is that yeah i don't believe it is just because of exams i don't believe it's just because we go off to boarding school and universities because those same numbers should be filtering into those systems yeah and they're not and i believe that we're funneling children in such a way that if you aren't in that winning team if you aren't at the forefront of it then cricket in particular is not for you yeah and that's a that's a real shame you know if we do our jobs well at the likes of spencer and at wimbledon we should have 60 children who turn 17 18 looking for adult cricket yeah within our clubs you know that's five extra saturday sides yeah. and that's not happening not even close to happening and so you know that's one of those conundrums that as a coach a good coach i think you've, you've got to be thinking about these things you've got to be looking at the game again as a whole not just your not just the uh you know the sessions that have been given to you or in front of you you know yeah. think bigger and think how we can how we can constantly shift and change the game yeah and just in conclusion now mm. what do you think moving forward how do you think the future looks like for coaching is it an easier sort of profession to get into now with all the health and well-being being at the forefront of a lot of people's minds yeah what do you think i think i think covid has done coaching profession a huge huge favor yeah uh, i do think that more people are looking to be active want to be active i think a young set of coaches who are looking to to form a career need not be scared of it it's going to be a lot of hard work and coaching though always is it's you know we talk about it being a career path it it sometimes feels a bit like a vacation yeah but the same can be said for teaching or for nursing you you've got to be prepared to throw yourself into it you've got to be prepared to work harder hours than a a lot of other jobs you know that and they can be quite unsociable hours as well you know we're talking kids so from four o'clock maybe to eight o'clock at night midweek and then all of saturday and then all of sunday the opportunities though are there for people who who want to do that you know i I, I don't know any cricket club or a coaching center that isn't actively trying to find good coaches Uh, i believe personally that motivation and that dedication is 80 percent of the job 
if you turn up and you're in the room actively wanting to develop those in front of you and yourself, all the little nuances of coaching are easily transferred. Uh, motivating people um, is quite difficult. And so anyone looking to get involved in the game and in coaching, I thoroughly recommend that you do. It is some of the most rewarding work it's instantly re rewarding and gratifying. There is instant feedback you receive. And there are not many lines of work where you, you, you get that constant feedback. It's an environment where there is no particular right answer. You know, there are there are good approaches, yeah. but you can carve out what you think the right answer should be and, and, and strive towards achieving that. And, and yeah, it's a, it's a hell of a lot of fun. Brilliant. Thank you so much, John, for coming in. I'm sure... A lot of young coaches out there will find this podcast to be extremely useful, extremely valuable. And uh, yeah, thank you. No problem. Thanks in. for having me.